Welcome to Law Subscribed. This is your dedicated news source for all things subscriptions and the law. My name is Matthew Kerbis. I'm the subscription attorney, and I believe subscriptions can help bridge the access to justice gap and incentivize attorneys to modernize and scale their practice like never before. In this episode, I interview Joanne Holmes. Joanne is the founder of Holmes at Law, a law firm dedicated to serving Web3 clients, billing them using the subscription model. Joanne is not only a pioneer in delivering predictable legal services to the benefit of her clients and her law firm, but she is doing it in a cutting edge space of blockchains, DAOs, NFTs, and cryptocurrencies collectively referred to as Web3. She uses her in-house and intellectual property law experience to be successful in her endeavors. We get deep on the subscription model applied to legal services in this one, and Joanne gives an easy to understand definition of the metaverse. Thank you to my sponsors, 650 and Gavel, links to both in the show notes and more on them later. You could sign up for the waitlist for my subscription seminar at subscriptionseminar.com. Please share this podcast with someone you know who would be interested in it. This podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only, and nothing said is legal, ethical, or financial advice. Without further delay, here's the episode. Joanne Holmes, better known as Joe, welcome to the podcast Law Subscribed. Thank you, Matthew. It's a pleasure to join you. Yeah, well, I'm so glad you reached out. I'm thrilled to find another subscription attorney out there. And go ahead and just introduce yourself to my listeners. Sure. My name is Joanne Holmes, as you shared. I own my practice, which is Holmes at Law. I am an intellectual property and digital assets attorney, and I help clients in Web3 and blockchain technology design compliant revenue ecosystems and manage the ever-changing legal and regulatory landscape that impacts Web3 and blockchain-based businesses. So fellow solo attorney, I love to hear it. What made you want to start, or, or you said a firm founder, are you a true, are you a solo or are you just a firm founder? How do you define yourself? There? I am a true solo. So many moons ago, I started my practice at a large full service law firm in the Atlanta area and worked in the technology and intellectual property practice group for several years. Then went for a number of years in-house, went in-house to support a business unit that had intellectual property in over 150 countries and serve as division counsel for that business, moved to a more senior role as a VP at another international organization that had a large global IP footprint. And in 2015, I started Homes at Law. And when I started my practice, I surprised I was focused in intellectual property, monetization and licensing and portfolio management. And in 2021, I moved my practice into the focus around Web3 and blockchain technology. And now all of my new clients are in that space. And I work solely on flat rates and monthly subscription fee basis with those clients. Oh, wow. There is there is so much to unpack there. So, okay. So when you were at that traditional law firm job, am I correct to assume that you were billing by the hour? I was, yes. That was the standard. And I think it probably still is at that firm. Yeah. Yeah. It is at most firms, right? And so just moving from billable hour work to an in-house role was probably a world of difference in terms of work-life balance. I know you're, while you're not on the clock traditionally, in-house can still be more than a 40 hour a week job from what I've heard, but like, what was that transition like to first move away from the billable hour? It's a good question, Matthew. As I recall, what I felt was a sense of freedom to just focus on servicing clients and not worrying about how much time it took to do that service and building relationships with clients that wasn't in any way impeded by how much it was going to cost because the cost structure of my support was already built in. Mm -hmm. uh, it also was really helpful for me because serving as in-house counsel in progressively more senior roles in different organizations, and even now serving as outside general counsel, I still oversee the billable work performed at large international law firms. I mean, my clients, again, have IP in over 125 countries at this point. And in that capacity, I'm looking at the billable rates of firms here in the U.S. and, and all over the world. So the difference between being in-house counsel and now even as outside general counsel overseeing is I'm focused on the relationship and pragmatic service to my client, making sure that I understand what the business goals are and how the law can line up to support those objectives. I have frankly been disheartened sometimes when I have been managing very large firms because in my experience, some of the work that they do is frankly CYA. 
It's not solving a pragmatic problem that the business needs to address an issue and be able to achieve the business goal. Instead, it might, for example, be a memo that is drafted so that there is a record that I was put on notice of something rather than helping advance the objective that I'm trying to achieve as counsel for a business. So I, I can't imagine that I would frankly ever want to go back to a billable hour structure. The flat rates and monthly subscription structure that I've created with my clients really helps to build trust on both sides, build long-term relationships. And as a business owner myself, it's helpful to have an advanced understanding around what costs are going to be. Mm -hmm. And if something shifts substantially, then we have a conversation and make sure that we're aligned before any surprise fees show up. I don't do that with my clients. And I think they respect and appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, there's, there's so much good stuff there, but, um, but I guess let's, let's talk about then when you went solo, mm -hmm. uh, 2015, did you start with alternative free fees or did you start with a billable hour? Like when you, when you were getting ready to launch, like what was, what did your business model look like? So when I was in-house counsel, I was on the management team of global businesses, and I thought that that was preparing me to run a business. But as you probably well know, being part of a larger organization and being an entrepreneur and founder yourself is a very different skill set. So when I started my practice, I really was just learning the skill of sales and marketing mm -hmm. and trying to build that rapport largely with small businesses. What I learned in the course of that, which I'm sure will not be a surprise to your listeners, is that small businesses oftentimes are very ambitious, but they don't necessarily have the budget to work with an attorney who at that point, I, I'd had over 15 years of experience in practicing law, now over 23 years. And so small businesses oftentimes don't have the budget to sustain an hourly rate because especially, let's say, for example, you're in a negotiation or you're submitting documentation to a governmental agency, you don't have control over what's going to happen after you've done your part of the work. So for example, when I was submitting a filing to the trademark office, we didn't know how the examining attorney was going to receive that, whether we'd need to file additional briefs, whether there'd be any third party challenges. And so it was challenging for a small business to design a budget around that. Similarly, if we were negotiating an agreement, we could certainly draft the template but we didn't necessarily know how the other side was going to come back, what changes they might require, how many times we'd have to go through revisions. So from that learning of starting off doing hourly work with those smaller clients, I found that a way that it could be more comfortable for them to manage a budget would be for me to give them sort of segments and say, this phase of the work mm -hmm. will be billed at this rate. And then the next phase at the next rate. And we could have more predictability in terms of what we could anticipate, understanding there would still be a need for some flexibility depending on what kind of feedback we got from whoever the counterparty was. After I had worked under that model for some time, I started to build up longer term client relationships who had recurring legal service needs. And that's when I started to test out the monthly subscription model. And what I found was that businesses who had been in existence for some time, typically at least 10 years, oftentimes 15 years or more, had weathered some economic ups and downs, had found a consistent product market fit with their customer base. Oftentimes their leadership team was very sophisticated in what they did, but they didn't have a consistent relationship with an attorney who could sort of come in and be a, a C-level, C-suite level partner for the other leaders in the business and take the legal work off of their plates and take away the need for them to source specialists. If, a, for example, a tax issue arose or an employment issue arose or a litigation issue arose, I would quarterback those issues for them. And so that was really my first entree into the monthly subscriptions was coming to a point where I could, with a more sophisticated client who'd been in business for a while, say, I will be your budgeted, consistent legal resource for the business. Yeah, yeah. I've heard since I've been I've been doing this podcast, one of the terms I've heard that I like is like general counsel as a service, mm -hmm. right? You're not full-time in-house counsel because maybe this business, it doesn't make sense for them to hire full-time in-house counsel, mm -hmm. but, but it does make sense to pay an attorney in a similar way, but at a fraction of the cost, also fractionalized in-house counsel would be another mm -hmm. 
term term for it. So is that sort of then what the role that you started to fill was that fractional in-house counsel role? Yes. And, and I phrase it as outside general counsel, but it's the same concept. And what I was really trying to achieve, what I'm always trying to achieve is efficiency and value for the fee structure that I'm receiving. And so one of the things that I try to be consistent about doing is encouraging the leadership team at my clients, let's make a regular point of getting together once a quarter or so to just talk about what's happening in the business. Because outside of those strategic meetings, I might be focused on a given agreement, a given negotiation, a given filing that we were working through. And my objective was to keep driving those things forward. I would also be checking in with my clients' leadership teams on a monthly basis to say, here's what's been happening on the legal side, because depending on who I'm working with on a given matter, maybe the CFO knows the work that we've done together that month, but the CEO doesn't. So making sure that the leadership team is aware of how we're making progress so that they see value in the investment that they're working, or excuse me, that they're receiving and working with a legal partner. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you, at some point that you, you mentioned, you decided to move to the flat fee subscription model. Like, where did you look to? Like, how did you, did you just look at other industries? Like, where did you find the resources to say, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to launch a flat fee and subscription, you know, based business model now for my law firm. A lot of it came from the experiences that I had had with clients in the first several years of Mm -hmm. my practice. I also looked at the models of fractional CFOs and I talked to my clients. I really said to them, we're working together on a regular basis. I see more things where I could provide value for you. Let's talk about a budget that would make sense for you, for me to be more consistently involved so we can make progress on some of the legal issues that we know need to be addressed. And for me to take some of these worries off of your plate. And so what I do to this day is I have certain services that I offer. And again, now I'm focused in the Web3 and blockchain space, but I have certain services that I offer based on paying attention to when clients were reaching out to me, the kinds of questions and concerns they were having, the stages that they're at in developing their business. So of the three ways that I work with clients now, the first two are flat fee because I've designed frameworks to provide the value that I've learned that clients need at those earlier stages of their work as a Web3 business. Whereas the last of the three services that I offer is akin to an outside general counsel subscription. And what I do with those subscriptions is it's very bespoke. Some clients want to know that we're going to check in once or several times a month. Maybe they want to be able to shoot me a quick email and I can send them back a quick resource say, yes, this is hair on fire urgent, or no, actually, because of what you're doing, this isn't really germane, so don't be worried about this, or this is worth a conversation, so in our next check-in call, let's talk about it in more detail. Some clients want me to, again, be quarterbacking other legal service providers for them, so a lot depends. Some clients need training and want their team to be aware of what the watchouts are. So again, it depends a lot on what support level the client needs. Because the work that I'm doing now is constantly changing and evolving, I am proactively telling clients, we should expect to evolve and be flexible on both sides of this relationship. I know that you've got to adapt to what's happening in the industry as well as law and regulation. And I've got to adapt to be able to support your business in the ways that it's growing and scaling. Yeah, this is all really good. So, so there's essentially, there's three different, there's three different ways that you build, right? It's like the one flat fee for at one stage, the mm-hmm. other flat fee for the next stage. Mm-hmm. And then assuming the business is going well and you did your job well and they like your legal services, then the opportunity is there to do what you call the bespoke subscription. So that means that you're going in and at that point, it's you're you're customizing a subscription to what that client's needs are specifically based on anticipated scoped work. Is yes. that right? Yes. And it so, might be helpful. You go ahead. And I was going to say it might be helpful at some point for me to explain how I decided what those phases are and what those offers look like to contextualize for your listeners. Yeah. And, and also, I'm super curious about the process of building that bespoke subscription when they get to that third phase. But yeah, go ahead. Sure. So the three services that I offer are respectively called Architect, Assure, and Ally. 
And again, they're designed based on what I realized clients were consistently coming to me and saying that they needed support around. So Architect is designed, again, with the understanding that Web3 and blockchain technologies are very new to most businesses. And so if you have a legacy business, maybe even a legacy online business, you might not be aware of how there are opportunities to build additional ecosystems of revenue leveraging blockchain technologies, be that NFTs, DAOs, the metaverse, or otherwise. So I designed Architect as a strategy-focused service so that my clients can build compliant Web3 products and services. So that looks like a series of three one-hour consultations where we talk through that client's existing brand identity so that we can have continuity. Then in the second session, we talk through what blockchain technologies are available and make sense for adding value to your unique set of customers, clients, and followers. And then in the third of the three strategy sessions under Architect, we talk about the rollout of that MVP as well as what the ongoing ecosystem would look like. So Architect is designed around strategy, three one-hour sessions at a flat rate. Assure was designed as a legal consultation. It's a 90-minute consultation where we focus on the top three legal issues and frankly, ways that my clients can use law to leverage for business advantage. So I designed Architect because I found that clients were coming to me right at the cusp of launch of a new product or service or right after it's been launched and sort of worried nobody paid attention to the legal and regulatory issues. And so Assure is designed to not overwhelm a client with all of the issues that could be germane to their business, but to say, let's collaboratively identify the top three and let's go through and think about how you can address those with a realistic and pragmatic budget. And also how you can leverage law for competitive advantage. One of the things that I do is I advise accelerator programs. And so I'm always thinking through, instead of just being compliant, how do you build a business moat? And a lot of times people don't think about that additional value that an attorney can offer to say compliance is a business advantage. So that's what Assure is designed around. What are your top legal issues and how can they support your business? And then the last way that I work with clients is Ally. And Ally is bringing together both strategy and law. So what I found is because I'm working with clients across a myriad of industries moving into this Web3 vertical, I'm seeing how strategies for product and service rollouts are being successful and the ones that are having challenges. At the same time, I am that geek who's in this space all day, every day, watching how the law and regulation is changing. And so I'm jumping in and telling my clients, the latest SEC guidance or enforcement action suggests that we should pivot our strategy in this way, or the latest litigation that's coming out is suggesting that you have a risk in this arena. So the Ally product is really, again, serving as an outside general counsel, advising on strategy and law, both of those changing consistently. Mm -hmm. So that's why I've designed the three products to meet my clients where they are at their phase of Web3 business. Yeah, and, and I, I definitely want to, so so we'll, we'll hop into Ally in a second. And all of this is, of course, on, on your website, holmes, holmesatlaw.com and link in the show notes and all that under the services tab. But then something you, you mentioned that I just want to explain for my non-startup savvy listeners is the concept of a competitive moat. Uh, and so I, we haven't come across that startup term yet, but I love startup jargon. Just want to quickly explain it. So it's essentially a competitive advantage that a company has achieved that's harder for other companies to come in and compete. And I've, I've yet to, to hear about building a, a, like a competitive like business, legal strategy, and compliance moat, or that's part of your, you know, your strategy there to have have a moat. So that's first of all, I just want to, you know, kudos to you there, and just had to explain explain that to some of the listeners who was, who aren't sure what that is. But so then let's let's get into, um, you know, let's get into the ally side of things. And then my my question for you there too is going to be, like, is is it a pure subscription? Like when you figure out what that amount is, they just pay that that monthly fee and there's like check-ins or there's subscription add-ons or other flat fees or, and how you handle that that type of thing for work outside of the scope. Sure. So what I do up front with the goal of helping my clients understand and anticipate a legal budget is we collaborate in designing a bespoke ally monthly subscription for each client. So again, I'm a solo. My goal is not to have hundreds or thousands of clients. 
my soul, excuse me, my goal is to be deeply entrenched in service mm -hmm. for the set of clients who I can provide distinct value to. And so what would that collaboration look like? I'll give you some examples of the types of things that clients have found value in. And I, I alluded to some of this before. Some clients want to start out with making sure that their team knows what are the watchouts from a legal and regulatory perspective that we need to consider in the Web3 space. So it might involve one or a series of workshops where I'm training their team on what to look out for, what kinds of language and representations are okay or they should avoid in their own client conversations, what kinds of representations, what kinds of marketing claims and so forth. Another thing that a lot of clients want is a regular check-in. So that might look like once or multiple times in the course of a month where we're getting on a call or a video chat and we have an agenda where we're talking through a set of issues that they want to bring to my awareness and that I want to bring to their awareness. Some of them want to have email access to me for what, for lack of a better term, I refer to as quick questions. Oftentimes I'm not looking to necessarily, in fact, I'm always not looking to make things any more complex than they need to be. So if a client has a question, I might be able to send them an article, a governmental agency resource, something that I might have recorded on a podcast and say, this is the answer to the question that you need. If this is sufficient, great. If not, let's talk about it when we have our next check-in. Some clients want me to get involved in actually reviewing agreements. And what I say to them is, if you already have an attorney who has to date supported your business, what I can add value around is understanding why the terms of an agreement are going to be different when blockchain technology is involved. You know, why are the royalties on chain on a blockchain going to be different than the royalties off chain? Why are the ways that you collaborate with someone in an NFT going to be different than the way you might in some other traditional creative collaboration? Adding that layer of understanding in blockchain technology where most attorneys don't even understand the words that we're saying in this space is where I can add value. Some clients are going to need a depth of expertise in, let's say, for example, securities law, or they have an anticipated client base in the EU where the MECA regulations are going to be important. And so rather than someone on their team, typically on the founder team, going out and sourcing all of that, I will again quarterback the legal service function. So there's a real myriad of services that I can offer a client as their outside general counsel or in a lesser, more bespoke advisory role. It really depends on what that client needs. Yeah, this is so interesting. So so then like, like, do you have like a checklist? Like, cause you're all about efficiency. You're not billing by the hour. Like when it comes time to have that meeting with the, with the client to build that bespoke subscription with all the things that you were just talking about, like, like, you know, like what's your process to make sure like, okay, we're efficient here. We're going to figure out, you know, here are the, do you, like, do you have set items or is it really just like truly bespoke where you don't know what the subscription is going to look like going into it, or you kind of have these like schema in mind of like, we're going to look like this, or we're going to look like that. Like, what does that process look like so that a, an attorney who's listening might be able to do like a repeatable version of what you're doing for their own practice? That's a good question, Matthew. So because I have done this several times with clients, and frankly, because I am the professional service provider, I see it as my role to lead the client and help them understand what the potential options are and then to help them think through what's going to provide value for them at the stage they're at. Mm -hmm. So yes, there is a list of services that I can offer to a client that may vary, you know, which ones of those services make sense for them. It may vary in how often they want to have those interactions. I'm also not a stickler about commitment. And mm -hmm. so I've had clients who are at a stage of their business where they need a lot of support and guidance and feedback from me at one stage and say, this got us to where we need to be for now, Joe. We're going to come back to you when we're at, you know, fill in the blank stage, maybe because they've raised more capital, maybe because they've grown in their recurring revenue, mm -hmm. whatever the case may be, we're going to come back to you. But what I have found over the course of my career is that building good relationships, being a pragmatic attorney and providing good value has served me well over the long term. So I'm never trying to lock my client into 
a long-term commitment. I'm trying to consistently provide them with value. And another thing, and another reason why that's not critically important to me is because one of the ways I add value to my clients is working with a variety of businesses across this space. Because this industry is still so nascent, it's actually a benefit to me to not only work with a few clients all the time. Right. It's one of the reasons why, for example, I work with accelerators so that I actually am advising clients across five continents who are building in this space. So I get a perspective that lends more value to my clients by virtue of the fact that I work with a diversity of different businesses in this space. When I went solo, I pivoted from mostly litigation to a transactional only practice. I did not have a database of documents to automate. That's why a business and employment legal document database and automation tool like 650 is super useful. I can rely on the quality of the documents in 650's database since they're putting excellent legal minds to work curating and updating their documents and automations over time. When you're not billing by the hour, outsourcing and efficiency matters and 650 can help you scale your practice to get high quality documents drafted in less time. Use the code law subscribed at 650.com and would be an onboarded to get 10% off. If you're not a business and employment attorney, or you have your own documents that you'd prefer to use, then my next sponsor, Gavel, is the automation tool for you. Gavel allows you to build shareable, client-facing workflow and document automations. In other words, Gavel helps you create a legal practice where attorneys can monetize the value they bring clients in productized form at scale via subscriptions and flat fees. Use the code LAWSUBSCRIBED at gavel.io to get 10% off an annual subscription. There's no one right way to automate and scale your practice, but with one or both of my sponsors, 650 and Gavel, you can take your subscription law firm to the next level. Links to both in the show notes. Now back to the show. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I guess the next, the, the natural next follow-up question would be, but is your firm in the metaverse? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, it's interesting that you say that. I think we're already starting to interact with the metaverse in it. And a lot of this is a question of definition, but the fact that you and I are now speaking over video chat on zoom, right? Some people consider that to be the metaverse. Other, other attorneys, in fact, who I know have offices in the metaverse. So for those who aren't familiar, the metaverse is reflective of virtual digital spaces. So you might have children, for example, who builds communities and have a lot of interest in something called Roblox. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there might be others who participate in World of Warcraft or Minecraft, but young people are very accustomed to building virtual digital worlds where they interact with communities of peers. In the Web3 space, that is also happening, but whereas your kids who are doing things in Roblox and all of the assets, the skins and emotes and weapons and everything that they use to interact in those gaming worlds are owned by the corporation. In Web3, those would be something called NFTs or non-fungible tokens, and those assets are owned by the people playing the game as opposed to the corporation. So there's a whole spectrum of you know what people consider to be the metaverse, and even within Web3 metaverse worlds, there are different environments, Decentraland and the Sandbox, and Facebook has its Horizon world. So there are lots of different digital communities where people exist. I think it's inevitable that we're all going to continue to lean into digital technology. So I guess in some ways we are. Anyone who is participating in servicing clients using video chat is in some way already participating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, I, I, I gosh, I got to start marketing myself as a metaverse attorney just by virtue of me being a virtual law firm. <laughs> uh, you know what's interesting, Matthew, is I, I was actually reading a legal study earlier today. Clients expect for us to make ourselves accessible and convenient to access. And so I think it serves everybody. It serves attorneys for a better quality of life and shorter commute times. And it serves clients with being accessible in ways that make sense for their lives and their businesses. Right. And, and, but just because you're accessible on Zoom or through Calendly or these other tools doesn't mean you're accessible by the billable hour, right? Which is why a move away from the billable hour is also part of that accessibility. It's not just accessible through technology, but accessible in terms of price too. I think so. So, and, and getting into the technology side of things, 
you know, like what what are some of the tech, what's some of the subscriptions that you use to power your subscription and flat fee business? Yeah, I keep it really simple. So I don't know what they're calling it at present, but it's basically the the Google business suite. Yeah, workspace now. Now workspace. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Google workspace. Name has changed a few times. Um, mm-hmm. I use, you know, the the Microsoft suite. There's nothing I'm using that is you know, going to be really unusual. The the core tech stack that powers my practice are Google, Microsoft, Zoom, mm-hmm. uh, to the extent that it makes sense for a given client or people who support my business as vendors, we might communicate via Slack. In Web3, it's very popular to communicate to communities over Discord. So there's nothing that I would share that's new or unusual under the sun that probably other small practices or solo practitioners would not already be using. Yeah, yeah, great. I think I think you actually might be the second attorney I've interviewed to mention Discord. So we, we're not we're not alone. But yes, especially in that Web3 space, Discord is, is heavily favored. And then like, what about in terms of like, in like receiving payments, right? Like, like, are you are you just accepting checks, ACH transfers? Are you using Stripe, you know, law pay? Like what's the, you know, what's the way that you're, you're, uh, you're getting those subscriptions so that you, you know, to the extent you could automate that, what are you using? So I use QuickBooks online for sort of sending invoices and receiving payments with all of my U.S. based clients. Sole way that I receive payment is ACH bank to bank transfer securely through the Intuit platform. For international clients, I will accept wire transfers because all of my fees are disclosed upfront before a client engages me. There are no surprises. And so all of my payments are received in advance for the services. So I don't spend any time chasing clients (laughs) to receive payment. Everything is understood and agreed to in advance. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And uh, I guess depending on the jurisdiction or I, well, if you're a federal practice, it doesn't really matter, I, or it's a, you know, federal law, but you know how you define what is and isn't an earned fee matters in the engagement agreement, mm-hmm. right? In terms of that, of like, you know, do you do you take that payment in advance and put it in a trust fund account, and then at the end of the month, you know, or at the end of the period, you know, you move it into the operating account? Like, how have you been how have you been handling that? Because that is a big question. That's a question I get a lot. Is mm-hmm. like, should I put it in a trust account first and then transfer it? Like, when do you do that? Do you need to do that? Like, every jurisdiction is different, but. But how have you been handling that kind of a thing? I've taken the cautious approach that once I have received payment, I well, and when I receive payment, it goes to the IOLTA or trust account. Mm-hmm. And I don't move those funds until I've earned them. So if a client should, for example, change their mind between the time that the payment is received and the actual services are provided, I've never moved it out of trust and I will return it back to that client. I've never had that occur. But just in an abundance of caution, I don't move fees into my operating account until I've earned them. Right, right. And, you know, I think as more and more attorneys adopt this type of innovative model, I think we'll have more rules around what is and isn't allowed and what is and isn't an earned fee. And is just the availability of making yourself available, is that an earned fee? Right. Mm -hmm. Like some of these, some jurisdictions have answered that question and some have not. But there's, if you could afford to do it, I think what you're doing is something that, you know, makes a lot of sense for attorneys who are cautious but want to dabble or try out the subscription model. I think that's sort of the soundest way to be careful in light of attorney ethics. <laughs> well, and, and to that point, I don't typically have clients paying me terribly far in advance of the service that I'll be providing. So if they've made a chance to move forward, Mm -hmm. I've shared the flat rates with them, or we've agreed on a monthly subscription, we're getting started pretty quickly, typically within no more than a week to 10 days, Mm -hmm. we're getting started. So it's, it's not a long lead time um, Mm -hmm. before I, I have in fact earned the fee. And to your point, you know, if a client is asking me to be available, for example, on a, an ally service where I'm doing any myriad of things or making myself available to, to do a myriad of things based on what the client's requests are, then it may be that my availability was in fact the way that I earned that month's fee. But I would still wait until that month is completed mm-hmm. before I move that fee over just because I want to have confidence that I have in fact made myself available and, and or done the things that we've agreed would be within that scope. Yeah. And is that something that you are 
at present still sort of manually going in at the end of the month? Or are you able to, through Intuit and QuickBooks, like automate that transfer at the end of the month? How do you handle that? So again, because I don't, I don't have, and I don't aspire to have lots and lots of clients. I'm always aware of who I'm working with, what my deliverables to them are. Once a month, I go in and reconcile everything. There's probably more that I could automate, but it literally takes me about an hour once a month to just sort of look through what's in the trust account, what have I earned and move over you know, set up the, the authorize the payroll and so forth. So because I've been doing this for over seven years now, I've got a pretty good sense of how my practice works. And again, I'm always looking for efficiency. So right. not having, you know, complex invoices to send out because I'm billing on an hourly rate and needing to go back and look at the work and see if that is going to align with what the client expected and you know, do I need to add on more of an advance for work than I'm anticipating? My invoices are very simple and straightforward and they're paid before the work starts. So yeah. it makes my financial reconciliation process pretty simple. I, I mean, I almost wish we would have started with that because while there are, were a lot of selling points to the model for the way you're, you're using it, I feel like that's the most important one. A hundred percent collection rate, right? Like no chasing clients for any funds. You know, I feel like like legal departments, you know, law, law firms or like, you know, like in-house teams who are hiring outside counsel, like there's so much waste just around billing. You yes. know, imagine how much waste we could eliminate from law firms and, you know, hiring departments, you know, if you if you weren't arguing about the bills. And frankly, for me, again, because I practice in an area that requires constant attention mm -hmm. to how the law and regulation are changing, it's a much better use of my time for me to be paying attention to what is the latest issue that would impact my client's business than for me to be focusing on invoicing. Right, right, exactly. And it's easier to stay a true solo that way when when you're not having to do that. So so have you found that you're you're working with more institutional clients who have like hired law firms before or like in what ratio maybe compared to, you know, clients who have never worked with an attorney before? What what does that look like? It's an interesting question. For the clients for whom I am a good fit, they will almost universally have worked with counsel before. Um, I work best with businesses that are existing or professionals who have had success in their profession historically and are moving into entrepreneurship. So for someone who, for example, is an artist and they are looking to issue an NFT collection, if they have not run a business as an artist before, this is their first collection, this is their first entree into blockchain technology or digital assets, I'm probably not the right attorney for them because I'm a very business focused lawyer. In some ways, I use law as an entree to get to talk about business strategy. So I find that I am the best fit for clients who have an existing business, have sophistication, have found that product market fit, have done well in their business, and they're looking to diversify their revenue, or they are committed in the Web3 space, they've already you know, moved into the Web3 space, they are launching or they have found that traction and they're looking for a legal resource to support their ongoing success. Mm -hmm. Those who are not as savvy in business are probably not going to be the better fit for me. Yeah, I, I get a lot of inbound from Web3 because I, 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 I'm I on that Entree platform that we talked about before the show got started. And, and very rarely, once in a while, I do get some business savvy folk. Mm -hmm. And so I actually thought of someone who came to me where I couldn't help them with their thing, but they actually might be a good referral for you. So see, magic happens on Law Subscribe. <laughs> Much appreciated. Yeah, just everything that you're talking about, though, seems like it, like who your client avatar is, who you're looking for. That seems to make sense for that. So then, in, in light of the fact that you're like high, that your client, your your ideal clients are a little bit more savvy and like they're more institutional, like maybe they've hired attorneys before, they've been around uh, counsel being hired. What's been their their opinion on? not having to pay by the billable hour where they probably had experience having to pay billable hour before. And now with you, it's predictable pricing. I mean, what, you know, what sort of feedback have you received from them? It's been very positive. And I'm, I'm frank up front again to being a solo and the recurring point of finding efficiencies. 
I'm trying to design my work and offerings to clients with a perspective of what it's like to be a business owner myself. Mm -hmm. And with the perspective of what it's like to serve as outside general counsel for businesses and thinking about what I appreciate from legal service, legal services providers who I am engaging for my clients. And so approaching it from a business perspective, it's hard to do business when you don't know what your costs are going to be. There are enough variables in business. So where I can strategically offer services that align and reflect my thinking. What I oftentimes get feedback from prospective clients about is, I see why Architect, Assure, and Ally are what you offer. It makes sense for what businesses in Web3 need. And I've very purposefully designed the pricing for my two flat rate offers so that a client has an opportunity to receive meaningful value at an economical price point. And what I find is I'm oftentimes giving so much information and so much feedback and strategy that my clients walk away and say, I'd like to come back and work with you. I may not be in a position to move on to Ally and have a monthly subscription relationship with you now, but I would like to. I also find that because this is what I do, there are very few attorneys globally who have the depth of experience in this industry and with this bespoke area of law, it supports my reputation when I've provided a good service at a reasonable, predictable rate. The fact of the matter is that attorneys who do what I do at larger law firms, and again, I've been in intellectual property, global IP work for over 20 years. My corollaries are regularly charging over $1,000 an hour. Mm -hmm. My rates are very attractive relative to that that kind of fee structure. And so it really builds trust. It builds long-term relationships. And I find that my clients become ambassadors and go out to their communities and speak well of me. Yeah, yeah. And and that's, you know, an access to justice and access to lawyers isn't necessarily the same thing. But, you know, these are I have to imagine that it would that, you know, the success of the business sometimes is like, what's their burn rate? And, you know, if they're overspending on legal, that could affect the business. And especially in this Web3 space where, you know, there are some fluff companies, you know, where it's like, you know, how many people are going to be spending, you know, up who knows how much money on NFTs versus, you know, some of these other really innovative Web3 platforms that could revolutionize the way we live and work. And, and so we want these businesses to succeed. And the way that they can succeed is sort of like going back to the moat example of legal business compliance is getting good legal counsel that's accessible compared to $1,000 an hour. So I think what you're doing is also an important service there and that access to justice, access to lawyers kind of a, a space. Any Any thoughts that you have on that? And then I'll have one more question for you. Sure. So my thought on that is when I frankly decided to do something that is not typically encouraged amongst lawyers, I decided to go to the avant-garde of law practice where there are not very many clear answers. And I really risked in many ways the reputation and career that I had built over 20 years to go out into a space where I would have to tell clients, I'm not sure about the answer to your question, but based on everything I know now, here's what I think is a more reasonable choice than some of the more risky options that you could pursue. And I've really had to just get comfortable with not knowing and being forthright with clients that it's not that I don't know, it's that no lawyer, including the ones who are charging over a thousand dollars an hour, know the answers to these questions right now, but I will help you find solutions. And so because I have been in technology and intellectual property for over 20 years, I was practicing in this space in 1999 and the early 2000s when and frankly, I was at Stanford in the late 90s when Google and Yahoo were being incubated on campus in real time. What I found is a lot of the wealth accrued to a very select few people mm -hmm. in Web2 in terms of e-commerce and the rise of the internet. Now, 20 years on into my legal career, and frankly, as a Black woman, I want to make sure that this next phase of the internet is more representative, more inclusive, mm -hmm that more voices are heard so that it serves more people, including marginalized communities. Mm -hmm. And I can't say that I believe that and not be willing to put my talents on the line to help make that happen. So right. 
when I think about the way that I organize my services, or when I think about the fact that, as I shared with you previously, I spoke over 30 times last year on podcasts and panels and at conferences to help feel, help people with making this technology feel more accessible. I feel like those who work in this space have a responsibility to educate, to be good advocates, and to help people feel like they have value and should be participating in AI, blockchain tech, robotics, the internet of things. All of these things are going to impact our lives. And more people should be able to participate professionally and in their businesses in growing wealth from this new innovation. So I'm a big believer in making it accessible through the way that I service clients and who I invite to participate. Yeah. Yeah. And that really dovetails well into, into my last question for you, which is also representation in, in our profession. You know, if you look at ABA data on the profession, you know, there are more women going to law school than men now, but the leadership at the big law firms are still a bunch of attorneys who look like me, but are twice my age. And, and so, you know, what, what I've seen with this podcast is most of my guests are, are women and, and attorneys of color or women attorneys of color like yourself who are innovating in this space. They are trying to serve communities that look more like them who are priced out of legal services. They're adapting flat fee and subscription model to increase access to justice and representation. And so, you know, I'm, I'm just a white guy who with a podcast. So I'd love to get your perspective on, you know, why, why is it that, you know, that people like you are the ones who are innovating in this space? Well, first of all, let me say to you, thank you for the service that you're providing to the legal profession by having your podcast so that people can understand that this is an option available to them. For me, I'm a single mom. My daughter is now in her early 20s and has graduated from college, but you know, she was born the year that I started practicing law. And so I had to constantly find that middle ground between professional service in serving my clients the way that they deserve to be served and the commitment that I have as a mother. And for me, that m looked like in you know, one of my in-house counsel roles, being able to work from home many, many years before the pandemic, before many people were even considering that quality legal services could be provided remotely. I, as I've mentioned, manage intellectual property in over a hundred countries. There's no way I can be in all of those places so I can do that work from home. For me, the reason why I started my practice is because my daughter was at that point in high school. I was realizing I had a finite amount of time left with her before she went off to go live her life. And I didn't wanna have any regrets. I was a vice president at an international company. I had clients in North America, Europe, Africa, and Australia. So there was never a time of day when I didn't have clients working and my whole life was being the attorney to that business. And I made a decision that it was more important to me to not have regrets about the way I mothered my daughter than the golden handcuffs that I have negotiated for myself in, in that role. What I would encourage people to do is think about what serves you. You earned the law degree. You're out getting the experience and servicing the clients. If the way that you've been practicing doesn't service you, break out of the mold that attorneys are encouraged to stay within and think about how you can design a practice that both serves your clients and serves your life. And if flat rates make sense for that, then I would absolutely encourage people to do it. I left a large law firm because I had candid conversations that it would mean I wouldn't be able to have the time with my daughter that I wanted to have with her when she was still in preschool. That wasn't going to work for me. So at every stage of my career, the commitments that I don't want to have regrets about in my family have driven what I was comfortable with doing in my career. And I have no apologies or regrets for that. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think that, you know, the subscription model rewards efficiency, which women who are in big firms are punished by being efficient because of having the courage to want to spend their time with family, like you said. And so the billable hour just doesn't work for that. And so, you know, thank you for being a pioneer in this space and for showing that it can be done. With that, Joe, I just have one final question for you. My actual final question, which is, is a hot dog a sandwich and why? <laughs> you know, I think analogously, if a hot dog is a sandwich, then a taco has to be a sandwich as well. 
And it's hard for me because I always, I don't only have one slice of bread on my sandwich. I always take the top bun off. Mm -hmm. So all of my sandwiches are open face. So if I follow that logic, then both a hot dog and a taco could be a sandwich because in my life, a sandwich does not have a top and a bottom. So then follow-up question, rare follow-up question to this one. <laughs> in light of that explanation, which I actually really like, is as closest to my answer, which I haven't given yet, is, is a pizza a sandwich? Oh, I guess it could be. Yeah, I guess a pizza could be a sandwich. So I guess we're getting to, like a lot of times I will have shrimp tacos because they're really quick, easy. I don't finish work until late in the evening. And so I'm like, what can I defrost quickly and eat dinner quickly? And so I guess a sandwich is just something that has contents with some manner of wrapper, even if the <laughs> wrapper isn't fully enclosed, like maybe a burrito. So yeah, I guess a pizza could be a sandwich. And if that didn't prove while you're a great metaverse attorney, I don't know what what what, what is because it's like defining the metaverse, right? And you need a good lawyer to be able to do it. So I loved that. Favorite answer yet. Joe, thanks again so much for coming on the podcast. If people want to follow up with you, where's the best way for them to do that? So the website is Holmes, H-O-L-M-E-S. A-T-L-A-W, holmesatlaw.com. I'm very active on LinkedIn. You can just search Joanne Holmes attorney and you would find me there. I'm pretty interactive and I love to see what people are building in the Web3 space. I really encourage attorneys, if you have any interest in this space, everything that I have learned, I've learned from free resources like YouTube and podcasts and reading. So if you have any interest in this space, it's a blue ocean. You can set yourself apart practicing in Web3 law and I encourage you to join. We need more attorneys who are committed to serving clients well in this industry. Well, thanks again so much for coming on the show. Bye for now, Matthew. Thanks again to 650 and Gavel for sponsoring this show. The best way for others to discover this show is for you to share it with someone you think would find a value from it. Follow me on LinkedIn since that's where I'm most active on social media and click the bell towards the top right of my profile to get notified about all of my posts about this podcast and everything else I think is valuable for you to see. To get in touch, message me on LinkedIn or email kerbis at lawsubscribed.com. All links are in the show notes. Until next time, this is Matthew Kerbis with Law Subscribed.